unfortunately, marketing, just like selling, that's all we hear. It's like you have to find the gap, make them realize the gap and then wave the magic wand. Oh, how would your life be if, you know, imagine if only. And then, of course, you have to clear uh, objections and all of these kind of template things. And you're like, oh, my God, I hate my job. Why am I doing this? This is Rebel Therapist, a podcast for entrepreneurs who are trained as therapists and who want to level up their businesses, make a bigger impact, feel fulfilled, and be very well paid. I'm your host, Annie Schusler. If you're a kind and gentle person, do you sometimes wonder if you can lean into those qualities and grow your business? Or do you worry that you have to let those qualities go to be really successful? In other words, do you sometimes wonder if you have to be an asshole to really have a successful business? My guest today is committed to doing things gently and ethically. You're going to hear some specific choices that my guest and I have both made in the past that we wouldn't make again because they didn't feel right. You'll also hear what's actually working for my guest to grow her business. Introducing Sarah Santa Croce. Sarah encourages people to bring more empathy and kindness to business and marketing. As a hippie turned business coach, Sarah hosts the Gentle Business Revolution podcast and works with heart-centered entrepreneurs to question their assumptions when it comes to marketing and give them permission to market their business their way. Welcome, Sarah. Thank you so much for being here. Ah, It's a pleasure. Hi, Annie. I'm so glad we get to connect. Me too. So I know that you help people figure out their marketing superpowers and you help people design authentic marketing plans. And you've been so generous in allowing me to ask you about your own business rather than sharing that expertise. And I'm just so excited to jump in with you. So can you tell us now how you make money and what your offers are. Yeah. And I, I, I want to just kind of share in the lead up to this, we had this email exchange and I said, Ooh, that's, you know, that's really vulnerable is especially because I, I feel like I'm still in the early days of that new business. And so I was on one hand really excited, but on the other hand, I think you you know, that's probably from other guests. It's like, oh, okay. Yeah. So this is, this is when, you know, <laughs> we're having the real talk and, and I love it. So, so yeah, the way my business works or the way I, I think of it as a, a flywheel, meaning like, you know, how do I want this ecosystem to look like? And I, I have these different parts. And as you said, there's different uh, programs in the in the business. And so the first one, I think, um, is the community. Because what I did wrong in my first business, in my LinkedIn consulting business, is that I hadn't actually really focused on building a community. I always had great relationships with my clients and, you know, kind of like I was out there a lot, but there was no place where we could hang out. And so that is the community. And, and right now that's the circle. And so the circle is not like your typical membership where, you know, how, like that was like the big thing 10 years ago. But even now you see a lot of these things, they call them community now, but they're actually still memberships where the guru is teaching something and people basically come for content. The circle is not like that. The way I see the circle is really in a circle. Like I see people sitting in a circle and having conversations around business, life and marketing I'm there to hold the space to have these conversations, oftentimes, yeah, vulnerable con- conversations, but I'm not the guru. I'm not there to teach anything. I can bring in my point of views and my te- like my um, experiences, but it, it's not like here's the PowerPoint and here's those three things that you need to learn today. So that's the community uh, aspect of it. I have a question about that. So as when I'm running my small group programs, 
one thing, there's this one tension, or maybe there's a lot, but there's one tension that I am kind of dealing with, which is sometimes people give each other bad advice in my in my groups. And I jump in and say, okay, I wouldn't do that. And I, you know, and I say it with love and respect, but also with like, I've watched a lot of people go through this. I've helped a lot of people go through this stage of business that we're talking about. And like that would send you down a that would likely send you down a bad rabbit hole. So here's this tension where I also want to create community and I want to help people listen to each other. And sometimes I, if I hear someone giving bad advice, what I think is bad advice, or I think I actually know is bad advice, I break in. And, and I know there's a certain cost to that in that the good thing is that it can save a lot of time, but the bad thing is it's not like in my group, we're all equal. I'm definitely saying like, all right, here, I'm going to bust in. So does that ever happen to you or how, or do you just kind of set things up so differently that it isn't within that construct that I'm talking about? I think it does happen to you, to me, but it, I'm not really wanting people to come with that idea of this is the place where I'm going to learn new things. And so people give me advice. It's more like, here's what what I did and, you know, this worked for me. And then maybe I'll come in and say, yeah, this didn't work for me. But then I often, it's like a ping pong ball that then I give back to the others and say, what did you do? Did you this, did this work for you or have you seen it work? So I really come from this idea of a leader in each chair where I don't see, um, you know, all the people who are there as beginners. And oftentimes they're not um, because they have, you know, maybe they're beginners in this new online business, but they have been in a 30 year corporate career or, or so I try to really bring on in all these different aspects of as well. And, and yeah, I have the same thing. I'm like, Oh no, you know, maybe that's not the, the, the right thing. So I, I, I will also share my perspective, but then I'm always open the room again and say, what do you think? Uh, who else wants to jump? That in? makes sense. And, and also if people are speaking from their experience, then that's different than advice. And if someone brings in, you know, what worked for me was building my entire business on Instagram, then that's true for them. And then in that case, I don't have to say, mm, I wouldn't do that. I can just add, well, here's where Instagram, maybe here's why Instagram worked for this person and kind of put it in context. Yeah. Thank you. I know I wasn't here to get free coaching or. <laughs> no, this not is at all. No, no. So no this is good. Yeah. No. And, and I think. And I'm not, you know, here to teach you anything, but I'm just sharing again. This is where well, you might be me. by accident, though. So. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, besides the the community, and this is still, you know, a, a small community. I basically started it last year, more or less, and I ran a Kickstarter for my book, and with the book, I told people, you buy the book. It was you know, basically a $60 support to help me launch this book. And with the book, you get a year of access to this community. So a lot of people are still in there pretty much for free um, because, you know, they, you need to actually build this trust and belonging to want to be uh, in this kind of community where it's it's like you need to really understand that what you're getting out of this community is not more content or more advice, but it's really that kind of different view on business and marketing and the support to say, yes, we can do marketing differently. Yes, we can do it in a gentle way. So that's what I'm doing with the circle. So would you say the circle is kind of your main offering right now? Uh, it's, it, it is 
always depends. It's definitely where my heart is and what, where I, I feel like my people are and where I create belonging. In terms of the income, uh, clearly it's not my main offering. My main offering is probably my one-on-one -on -one coaching. So the the one-on-one -on -one business coaching. I also uh, still give LinkedIn workshops. So that's pure training workshops in companies or, or yeah, ma mainly small companies. So those are the big rocks, the one-on-one -on -one coaching and the, uh, the marketing or LinkedIn workshops in companies. And then the small rocks are, I have a, a marketing online course. So that's where I take people through this different way of, of marketing in a gentle way. And, and that is Probably the, you know, people talk about scaling. That would be the one that is scalable compared to, you know, the life, uh, the the one-on-one -on -one coaching where obviously it's limited in, in time. What about the circle? Does that feel highly scalable? It does. It, it is built uh, with the idea that it can grow. At the same time, th that's not the message I'm kind of sharing within the circle because I've noticed that I'm in other groups or communities where the guru so to speak keeps talking we're going to grow this thing and it's going to be huge and and I'm like I'm right here you know are, aren't we enough <laughs> what like now? what about me <laughs> so I really that learned that that is not a good feeling to feel like I'm just a number and that I'm not enough and, you know, like keep getting more people in. So that's one thing I learned from being a member of on other communities. The other thing I learned is when you have the guru keep bringing in their friends to talk about certain things and not actually going within the community and say, Let's see what kind of talent and expertise we have within the community. Let's highlight the actual members who show up here, you know, on a regular basis. So I love that. Well, what about for you? I mean, so you're not telling folks in the community, we're going to grow, grow, grow. But for you, in your vision, do you, would you like it to over the long term grow or do you, do you want to kind of keep it small? I, I think so right now there's there's about 40 people in it and you know how the how these calls go it's not always like not always everybody shows up so it's probably about 15 to 20 people who are on the call each time that's actually a pretty good percentage showing up but yeah yeah and then we go into small groups so I think 50 people to have 50 people uh, regular people, would be a good number. That's what I feel like that that would be, you know, a good number for me to have 50 people on the call and then split into small groups. If it gets bigger than that, I have actually already uh, kind of promised uh, my Australian uh, people I'll add another call because it's always hard to find, you know, the right times for, for people in Australia. So I'm like, yeah, I'd love to, you know, split it into two once it grows to a size where we feel like we can't have these intimate conversations anymore. In just a minute, we're going to talk about how Sarah brings in clients and some of the ways she's automated her business. And first, I want to invite you to register for Create Your Program. This is my five-week process to expand beyond private practice. You're going to go from having an idea or even a bunch of ideas to actually launching a pilot program. This is a small group experience where you're going to get a lot of brave work done in a supportive group of driven and open-hearted entrepreneurs like you. This is for you if you're a therapist or a healer and you want to expand your business. If you're listening to this before September 8th, 2021, the price is about to go up. So if you've been meaning to jump into this program, this is an excellent time to do it. So head over to rebeltherapist.me slash create to register. Okay, let's get back into it with Sarah. What if like 100 people wanted to sign up? Like, would you feel like, okay, yes, I want to like find ways to keep this intimacy and and bring in these new numbers? Or would you feel like, no, I, I kind of want to keep it smaller? I think I would ask my people. I would ask 
them. I would have like a vote and say, how would it feel to, you know, grow this beyond X amount of people? Uh, do we still still feel like since we can, you know, Zoom is great, can still split up into smaller groups, but obviously you wouldn't know most of the people every time it would be different people. So would that feel good or not? And um, yeah, go from there. That's so interesting. I love that that's your first answer is like, ask, ask the community. So with one-on-one, how do you, how do you deliver the one-on-one? Is it with one-on-one calls or asynchronous? Like, how does that work? Yeah, I have uh, um, one-on-one calls, but only uh, once every two weeks. It's I have a three-month minimum. So compared to some other coaches who have minimum six months or, or even a year, I say, I believe in quantum leaves, basically. I, I feel like I work only with smart people. <laughs> and smart people, sometimes they can get a lot of stuff done in three months. And I feel like I have hired coaches and it, I paid for six months or a whole year. And then after, you know, half the time, I feel like they couldn't give me anything anymore. And that left me off feeling maybe almost less of them, which, you know, it wasn't true. It's like, they were still a good coach, but since I felt like I overpaid, it just didn't feel good at the end. And so I want my coaching to be, uh, yeah, three months. I think still transformation takes time. So it's three months minimum. But then after then, after the three months are up, we decide whether we need more time or, 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 or not. And, and obviously they decide whether they want to continue or not. So it, yeah, it's, it's coaching. So one-on-one calls. But then a lot of the work actually happens between the calls. So uh, I use either Google, Google Form, uh, sorry, Google um, yeah, Docs, Google Drive, Google Drive or Trello, whatever they prefer. And uh, so a lot of that back and forth happens over there. Okay. Where you're looking at their work and they're sharing mm-hmm. things yeah. with you. Yeah. Okay. Interesting. And, they, and with your calls, how long, how long are your calls? They're 45 minutes. Okay. So that you were saying earlier that that's really a big part of your revenue is your, is your one-on-one packages. Do you, do you feel like when you look at your, not that you have to know the exact numbers, of course, but when you look at your business as a whole right now, does it feel like where your revenue is coming from and where your time is going to is kind of into similar spots, like where one-on-one is where most of your time is going and most of your money is coming from, or how is that lining up right now? I would say, so, so yeah, the, the coaching and the workshops are where the big rocks are, right? The workshops, the LinkedIn workshops, they're the, the easiest for me because they just come first of all by referral, uh, because I've been doing this for so long and it's, it's easier to charge a certain amount because they're companies, not individuals. And also because they're mainly rinse and repeat. I've been doing this for so long that I put them, you know, the slides together rather quickly. So not a lot of time goes into those. Yeah. And with regards to, or in comparison with the, with the income in terms of the, the coaching, I, do simplify everything. I, um, my, my, the name of my business, uh, the the way it's registered is simplicity. So I really think I streamline everything. And so I make very much sure that I have boundaries in place that people don't email me for the coaching. Everything has to go in the Google Docs or on, on Trello. And so I, I feel like, yeah, I do spend cognitive energy on my clients, what, even when we're not you know, in our calls. But in terms of does it drain me? No, it does not because it's, it, it feels like there's clear boundaries and, and uh, we, yeah, we, we know we know how we work through that and together, and I make that clear in the beginning. How many one-on-one clients do you like to have at a time? 
I only take three one-on-one clients per month. So, so that feels like that's the amount of energy I can give. I do also every now and then when I can make it happen, I like to offer options to people who say, look, I can't afford one-on-one coaching. So either obviously there's the online course, but a lot of people, they want more than an online course, but maybe not exactly the, the one-on-one coaching. So I, I started doing semi-private coaching. Mm. <laughs> and I, I, uh, yeah, I remembered my, my kids swim, swimming lessons. I'm like, oh, that was cool. We paid half the price and still, they, you know, they swam just as much. So I'm like, you know, why not doing semi-private? And so it's, it's exactly what it says. It's you split the time and you share the fee with someone else. And that, it doesn't always work, obviously, because I need to have two clients who want that at the same time. But when I can make it happen, I feel like that's a, a good option that for me, it's, I spend the same amount of one-on-one time with them. I do spend some more time in the Google Docs or Trello because I need to still answer their, their questions. And on top of that, they learn from each other. So it's not a group coaching, but it's a semi-private, which works out for me. Do you charge more than, like, if you've got two people doing that, do you charge more than twice as much because you've got the behind the scenes? Just stuff? like a hundred bucks more than, mm-hmm. than half would be. Yeah. yeah. Interesting. So it's like, one thing I like about that is that I haven't really heard of it before. And that's, <laughs> that's always cool. And then another thing is that it's not like it sounds like from how you're saying it that doesn't require any more marketing like it's not a it's not something that then you've got to have a whole bunch of new systems for it's just something that you can do with the systems that you already have and that makes it simple yeah it's basically when i i'm on a sales conversation with someone and they're like yeah i just can't you know can't do it then I either it just this week, what happened is like, well, I already had someone else that I knew uh, that I spoke to last week. So I'm like, well, next week, I'm going to talk to someone else. If she's interested in semi-private, I'll put you together and see if it would be a good fit. doesn't always happen like that. But then I can easily put a PS in my newsletter and say, hey, if anybody's interested, I have a (laughs) semi-private, you know, coaching spot. And so sometimes it works out and sometimes it doesn't, but I feel like it gives the person an option. And to me, that feels good to bring up in a sales conversation. Yeah. I also, so you just mentioned the PS and I feel like I haven't done the numbers, but I don't know how I would, but I feel like a lot of my sales happen through PS on emails that are not even mostly sales emails. They're about maybe my podcast or they're about an idea I'm having. And then there's a PS. I always have a PS saying, here's how you can get my help. And that is not a very sexy or complicated marketing tactic. (laughs) So there's not a lot to teach there and it's really effective. And I think that's, I think because it's not very sexy or complicated, people don't talk about it very much, but I think it's really effective. Yeah. That's interesting. Actually, the, there is, like, I've learned in many marketing programs that the PS is the thing that... Yeah, that's what people read. Yeah. <laughs> that's what people yeah. read. It's like, you go to the bottom, it's like... Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. And yeah, and you don't necessarily need... Yeah, there's just not a huge amount of training to do on how to do a PS. I feel like people could no. listen to this and have a sense yes. of how to do it. So... When people come into your orbit, first of all, how do you think or how do you know they're usually finding you in the first place? Mm. I would say podcasts. So my own podcast, the Gentle Business Revolution, and and then you know podcast uh, opportunities like yours, where I, I feel like people need to hear me and talk, and, and then they're like, "Yeah, I'm intrigued. I want to know more." Um, I try video, but it's it's just much harder for me. So usually audio is the best way. So I think that's where people find me. Then the hope is also eventually the book that you know people find me on 
Amazon or by recommendation, and then they want to know more about um, the author of the book. Absolutely. And do people still come into your orbit through LinkedIn as well? Yeah, they do. But it's it's not like I'm doing the active outreach anymore. I used to do that to build my LinkedIn business. But now I don't do that anymore. I feel like there's, you know, unfortunately, there's so much pitching going on on, on LinkedIn that people just kind of are always on their guard. They're like, is she going to sell me something? Uh, I'd rather not get <laughs> in touch. So, so people will find me through my content and then, you know, my people sharing or connect or commenting. That's how new people find me on LinkedIn, but not because I reach out to them proactively. So you do, you, you put a lot of your marketing energy into podcasting, both your podcast and guesting on podcasts. Do you have like a, a system for yourself or a practice for yourself of, I mean, you, I imagine you do with your own podcast of like how often it comes out and how much time goes into it. Will you share a little bit about that of how much energy that podcast takes? Yeah. Again, the simplicity, like I really streamline everything and I automate everything that's possibly automatable. I love workflows. I love uh, the tool uh, Zapier. I love IFFT. So all of these kind of tools. Wait, that, wait, what's IFFT? Uh, if this, then that. Is it like Zapier? It's like, it, yeah, it's the precursor of Zapier. So whatever you can't find on Zapier, or if you run out of SABs for the free account on Zapier, you go over to if this, then that. I think I-F-T-T maybe. If this, okay, then will, yeah. you, will you give us an example of one of your Zaps or if this, then that? Yeah. So for example, if someone fills in the intake form on Acuity uh, in order to get on, uh, uh, to be a guest on my podcast, the the intake form from Acuity, the information that people put in there, then gets added to my Trello as a card on Trello. And my team member, Andrea, gets notified that there's a new intake form and from there, she then knows, you know, how to create the show notes and, and all of that. So, so that's one. It also sends out a reminder that this episode is coming out. So, so these kind of workflows to, to really, you know, the, the time a lot of podcasters spend just, you know, obviously Acuity or Calendly or any of these uh, scheduling tools already, they're a big help. But you can really take it to another level if you then think, well, what needs to happen once I have this information? What needs to happen next? And then what? Who, who takes care of that? And, and, and so since we're all using these tools that are online, they're actually, all of them are interconnected, especially if you use uh, Zapier or IFTT. Beautiful. Beautiful. So, and another thing, I love is checklists, just like, so kind of even simpler or not, not simpler. They just are simpler to set up just checklists. Like I use notion and I have all these checklists so that I don't have to use very much of my brain when I am doing something that's like administrative. And, and then I could imagine like a checklist then leading to using Zapier. I only have one zap right now, but I'm so happy about it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It, it's, it's like the next level of checklists, I would say. Because, yes. Yes. Because then you don't even need to have the checklist anymore because it's done behind your back while you mm -hmm. sleep. <laughs> so cool. So what about systems for whether they're automated or unautomated? Like what's your practice around being a guest on other folks' podcasts? Do you spend time pitching or like researching folks or how do you how do you do that workflow? And I did try to outsource that to my virtual assistant, but it, it felt like it was hard to outsource because I I needed to kind of 
get the vibe of the podcast myself. Uh, so, so I took it back and, and decided, okay, I'll, I'll do that myself. I, um, I, so I search for different podcasts on uh, these sites like matchmaker.fm or, or pod, something with pod. So these different matchmaking sites basically for podcasters and guests. And then I do have a, a pitch, like a, you know, an email I, I, I wrote. I, um, I made a video. I think it helps for people to see who I am and how I speak and what I, so I, in the video, I present myself and I say, I think uh, your guests might appreciate talking about these topics and people love the idea of the video. So they, most doors are open. If I do my research well and I reach out, most doors are open to me. So, so that feels good. I was going to say something else. Oh, also what I do is I look at the, uh, you know, when I have guests on, I look at what kind of podcasts they were on previously, because often that's a good fit for me as well. So it's kind of like this, yeah, I go, I jump from this site. Oh, they were on this site as well. And then you just kind of keep finding more and more. So that really worked well for me as well. And then I can even say in the pitch, hey, I see that you've recently had Annie on your show. I think we would, you know, match well. And here's, here's my pitch. Yeah. That makes sense. It makes so much sense. And there's a way that like that is how we do things as humans, where we make friends and we find like the people in, in our worlds that way. <laughs> And it's so interesting that like so many of us don't think of that when it comes to business or I don't know, I want to put air quotes around marketing, that it's it's still going to be like all of the wisdom and the emotional intelligence that you have, you're then translating that over to podcasting. That makes so much sense. How How much time do you put into the guesting side? And I'm asking all of this because I think it's such a good strategy and I also know it's time consuming. Yeah. Yeah. And I do it. I have to be honest here. I do it in spurts. Like I did a lot because uh, of the book and, and then I need, I'm an introvert. I'm a huge introvert. So I need breaks in between uh, again as well, because yeah, it, you know, obviously it takes, oftentimes it takes 45 minutes an hour, but then so does everything else. Let's, face it, you know, uh, had I decided to go for Facebook ads, well, that takes hours and hours to first figure out how, and then, you know, no guarantee it works either. So everything takes time. And I'd rather spend the time getting to know people that I'm aligned with. And, and, and hopefully, you know, first of all, I get to know you, the the host, but then also uh, hopefully there's a ripple effect and there's uh, other listeners who are like, oh, I I agree with her. So I, I for me it's it's worth the the effort. But yeah, you're right. It it takes time. Yeah, and that's not even a bad thing. Like that's I I really love it too. I love listening to podcasts, so it makes so much sense to make that like part of our part of our marketing. Yeah. And the return on investment, I think is so clear <laughs> with, I mean, it takes a minute, but it's so clear with podcasting. And it, it's the right kind of people. Again, with Facebook ads, you don't know who you're really getting onto your list, right? That's the difference really, I think. Yeah. 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 And with a podcast there, you know, the listeners are hanging out with you for quite a while. So Yes. So you mentioned on your website, I noticed that you mentioned that you may have used some tactics in the past that you don't now feel good and you don't use now. And I want to say I absolutely have too. And I've talked about it here. <laughs> One of mine was about how I used to do sales calls. And I was trained by a really well-meaning coach to do them in a way that now 
I realized why they felt it felt so uncomfortable. Like one of those things was talk about results before you're ever willing to talk about price. And that's just not how I am as a human. And so I don't know why I would have wanted to do it that way on sales calls. And being on sales calls in a way that felt like it was about convincing people. So I just wanted to start off by (laughs) sharing one of mine. So is there something that comes to mind for you that you used to do or used to try that you don't any longer? And first of all, I I just want to say that I love that story and I'm actually writing a sales book now about, you know, kind of gentle selling and and that aspect. So I'm going to come back to you about that story because I think (laughs) it's so key. Like, yeah, unfortunately, marketing, just like selling, that's all we hear. It's like you have to, you know, find the gap, make them realize the gap and then wave the magic wand. Oh, how would your life be if, you know, imagine if only. And then, of course, you have to clear uh, objections and all of these kind of template things. And you're like, oh, my God, I hate my job. Why am I doing this? <laughs> yeah. So been there, done that. Definitely the sales call was, would be one of them. Um, what else came up for me um, is any kind of joint ventures, like just the term alone, when I think about joint ventures, there is this whole sector in the online space, people who call themselves joint venture partners. And again, not all of them, there's some really good people in there, but the whole idea of joint ventures to me now that I think of it is is all about maximization, uh, more, 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 more money, not really thinking about the people who buy these products, you know, that you are selling for someone else, basically, because the way a joint venture works usually is you become a partner some kind of affiliate partner who's sharing a big launch. And then, uh, you know, they, everybody gets the sales, sa- same sales copy. Here's your swipe copy. Uh, here's your affiliate link. If you send this out, uh, you'll get this much money. If you add your bonus to it, you'll get even more money. And yeah, it just doesn't work for me anymore. There are definitely good programs. Uh, I'm sure of it. But it's the same cookie cutter approach that they're selling, and I, mean, I just can't stand behind it anymore. So, yeah, you know, what do you think? What was glaring to you about that experience? Like, what was it that kind of made you feel like, "Ugh, I don't think I want to do this again." I mean, not not the specific situation, but just the like, oh, yeah, yeah. It's the idea that everybody does the same thing, and everybody does it brainlessly just because of the money not because they actually because they oftentimes as a joint venture partner you don't even know the program from the inside out so i think certain affiliations i i still do share certain affiliate links from people i know they do good stuff and i've seen their programs right and i actually really believe that this can help them but the joint venture world was all about big, you know, like big giant guru programs where it was all about the money. And that does not work for me anymore. So I, so you're not saying that you would never do an affiliate relationship as much as you're saying you want to be super mindful about what you would choose. Yeah. 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 And, and, and if I know that there's you know, a thousand joint venture partners, most likely it's not going to be for me. I want to know the actual person. I want to have a relationship with the person uh, who offers this program and not just be one of her monkeys who who sends out the same sales copy. And and again, we're sharing examples that I've done. So, you know, it's like, yeah, it's, it's part of the the things that you look back and you're like, well, why did I do it? Yeah, obviously it was the money, probably. It was maybe also kind of the everybody does it. And so this is just how business works. This is how this online business works. Same thing with the, 
you know, kind of the affiliations or when you're invited to speak on a summit, maybe that's another example. If I'm invited to speak on a summit, I want to clearly know what the agreement is, how I am supposed to promote the summit. Uh, if you ask me to send out three separate emails to my list, most likely uh, I won't join if that is in the agreement. If I feel like it's such a good program that I want to share it, I'll make my own rules how many times I'm going to share it. I 100% feel that way too, that if, if somebody would be asking me to share something and that's kind of in the contract, I know that's just how it's done. Like I know that's the normal way it's done, but I, I'm not up for it because exactly what you just said, if it's amazing and I think my, you know, sharing it with my list, if I think that the people on my list would truly benefit, then I'll share it, but I don't need someone to tell me to share it. Like, but I'm just going to share it. And it feels like the thing that one thing I think that sometimes people are missing is the much more important goal of their business, which I think is being really obsessed with how well you serve the folks that you're there to serve and the kind of results they get with you. And so if you're using some of that up, some of that trust up on something you don't really believe in, it's not still going to be there. Like I, I, I don't think it's, I don't think that equation works. So yeah, if we have in front of us our main mission of what we're there to do, then I think it makes it clear sometimes what to say no to. So yes, thank you for sharing that. So then that means that if we see you in a summit, it means that you're in something that you want to be in. Yeah. Yeah. And then I have done my due diligence also asked the questions, how do you market to your people? (laughs) And of course that, you know, that kind of, yeah, brings some questions up that, yeah, because a lot of, you're right, we think this is just how it works, right? But I'm here to say, well, maybe not anymore. Maybe it takes a few people to say, I no longer think that's just how it should work. So the people that I've yeah, been on, on summits on recently, when I brought this up, they're like, wow, thank you for, for saying that. Yeah, no, I, I agree. So it's all about you know value alignment, of course. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, and I've seen um, and now have also started saying and doing, um, I saw, I think the first person I saw it with was Kelly Deals saying, I don't do all white panels or summits or podcasts. And, you know, I absolutely also don't do that. So that's another, like, there's so many choices that could seem like you just make them by default and we absolutely don't have to. So would you be willing to tell us a little bit about how you spend a typical day? including any morning rituals that get you going? Mm-hmm. Yeah. I My kids are they're 15 and 18. So last year, my son said, the 15-year-old, he's like, you don't need to get up for me anymore. I can make my own breakfast. And so that was a, a big game changer for me because it meant that I could turn off my alarm clock. And that doesn't mean that I don't get up. But it's a big difference if you don't have to have an alarm clock on that, you know, tells you when you need to get up. So I start my day uh, basically with a, um, I do uh, alternate nostril breathing for seven minutes. That helps with hormones, I'm told. So I uh, kind of, it calms the nervous system, but also the uh, endocrine system. So I do that for seven minutes and then I meditate. I, I'm, you know, it's always, I think it's a lifelong practice. I don't, I don't know of any meditators who are like, I'm a pro at this. So 10 minutes and some days I can really get into it. And some days I'm just, yeah, lost in thought somewhere, but I want to keep doing it because I, I, do think it, it does make a difference. And then ever since uh, COVID, I started to do yoga at home. So 
that has really just become something that I can, yeah, I, I really notice it when I don't do it a day. So I try to do it 20 to 30 minutes uh, in the morning. And then, yeah, then I'm kind of like, okay, now I'm ready to, you know, turn on the computer or ha have breakfast and turn on the computer. And I start uh, by writing um, for an hour. Ooh, every day? Right now, like, again, in, in kind of, um, bursts, but right now, yeah, I'm um, working on the second book. So writing every day, one hour, gives me the best kind of momentum. I feel like, yeah, that's oh, that's I fantastic. Mm -hmm. Wow. So I am so grateful, and I'm excited that we get to continue this conversation on your podcast. Yeah, and. I'm just so glad to know you and thank you so much for getting vulnerable and letting us behind the curtain. Yeah, it's been, I can't believe the time went by already. It was, it was a, a great time to chat with you. Thank you, Annie. Now I'm going to loop back and share some takeaways that particularly stand out to me. Takeaway number one, when you're designing a community, you've got to set up clear expectations about the kind of communication that happens. In Sarah's community, she sets an expectation of people sharing their experiences rather than advice. It's more like, here's what, what I did and, you know, this worked for me. And then maybe I'll c come in and say, yeah, this didn't work for me. But then I often, and it's like a ping pong ball that then I give back to the others and say, what did you do? Did, you, this, did this work for you or have you seen it work? Takeaway number two. Sarah sets up clear boundaries in her one-on-one -on -one coaching so that she's not using extra energy tracking her clients. She teaches her clients in the very beginning where and how to communicate with her in order to get her help. I streamline everything. And so I make very much sure that I have boundaries in place, that people don't email me for the coaching. Everything has to go in the Google Docs or on, on Trello. And so I, I feel like, yeah, I do spend cognitive energy on my clients, what, even when we're not, you know, in our calls. But in terms of does it drain me? No, it does not, because it's it, it feels like there's clear boundaries. Takeaway number three, Sarah does a lot of guest spots on podcasts. It's a huge part of her marketing. For each podcast pitch, she researches the podcast and includes a video in her email. This gives the host a better sense of her and it increases the number of invitations she gets. I made a video. I think it helps for people to see who I am, how I speak and what I, so I, in the video, I present myself and I say, I think uh, your guests might appreciate talking about these topics and people love the idea of the video. So they, most doors are open. Those are three of my takeaways. I want to know what stood out to you. Send me an email at info at coachingwithannie.com and even better, include a voice memo so I can share your voice on the pod. Tell me what stood out to you from this conversation with Sarah and what it's helping you rethink in your own business. You can find out more about Sarah at sarahsantacroce.com. I want to thank Cosmo Palms for editing this podcast. If you found this conversation supportive, please share it with your favorite therapist or healer. That's absolutely the best way for us to reach more people. And thank you so much for listening. I'll see you next time.